Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Glenn Roberts, a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and microbiology at Mayo Clinic, as well as a consultant in the Division of Clinical Microbiology. Dr. Roberts discusses disease-causing dimorphic fungi and how to identify them in culture. This presentation examines sporotrichosis. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. I have nothing to disclose. The diseases caused by the dimorphic fungi are, as you see here, histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, coccidioidomycosis, paracoccidioidomycosis, sporotrichosis, and penicillosis. Histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, coccidioidomycosis, and sporotrichosis are found in North America. The other two are not. Uh, Paracoxidiotomycosis is found in Central and South America, and penicillosis is found in places like Vietnam and Cambodia and so on, and Thailand. The dimorphic fungi have a number of features that are in common with each other, and the growth rate is one of those. The growth rate depends upon a number of things. It depends upon how much uh, of an organism is present in a culture. It depends on the, the culture medium that you use for uh, recovering the organism, and it depends upon the individual metabolism of the organism. Blood enrichment is something that we see as a, there's a need for with recovering the dimorphic fungi. Certainly, them seem to have a requirement to grow better with blood enrichment, and others do not. And if they do require blood enrichment, this is a, an interesting fact that you can recover them better, but they don't sporulate well. So you have to subculture them to, a sp to another medium to allow them to sporulate. They all have very small, delicate hyphae. Dimorphic fungi all have the, this particular feature, but not all of the fungi that have small, delicate hyphae are these dimorphic fungi either. We do have nucleic acid probes, nucleic acid sequencing, and now Malditoff to help us identify these organisms in addition to traditional methods, which most of us probably still use and will for a while, using the microscopic morphologic features and a few other things to go along with it. This image shows you small hyphae seen with the dimorphic fungi, and it's hard to see that they're septate, uh, but they are, and they're just very tiny hyphae, probably 0.5 uh, microns in size. The colonial morphologic features of the dimorphic fungi vary a lot, depending upon the individual organism, the isolate, and also on the medium that you use for recovery, because they look a lot different just on three different media. They'll have three different morphologic features shown on each of those different media. The colonies of histoplasma and blastomyces dermatitidis are, are indistinguishable, and so we have problems with trying to use macroscopic morphology for helping us to identify these two organisms, we rely upon a microscopic morphology. This presentation will focus on Sporthrichinchii, and this organism is a bit different than all the others, too. This organism is dimorphic, just like all the others that we talked about. It has a yeast and a mold form, but it is an organism that causes generally subcutaneous infection that is a result of direct trauma to an area of the skin and some exposed surface like an extremity where the organism has been introduced, the mold form has been introduced from the environment into the tissue and then it converts inside the host to the yeast form. It's found worldwide, found primarily in the tropical parts of the world, but it's found worldwide. This happens to be a yeast-like colony of the mold form of Sporthrix. Now this is something that you see pretty often with this organism. It starts to grow and you think you're working with the yeast. In fact, you actually can develop an API profile for the yeast API aux system for identifying yeast. You can have a profile number for this particular organism because it looks like a yeast when you start off. And here you see another yeast-like colony of Sporthrix shinkii. The name Sporthrichinchii came from the following description. When you looked at it underneath the microscope, you noticed that the spores were produced and they were attached to a central hypofilament by a thread-like attachment. So the spore referred to spore, thrix refers to hair or thread-like attachment, and then shinchii is the term used to describe the person who first named this organism Dr. Schink in Baltimore. 
And so this is an example of one of the yeast flat colonies of Sporthrix schinkii in the mold form. Now here you see some stellate colonies or starlight colonies of Sporthrix. And all these things look different. They're all cultures of Sporthrix schinkii. And these do not appear to be all that fluffy. Here you can see a primary isolate from a patient that we had that had sportricosis. And notice the center of the colony is darker than the perimeter. In time, this culture will begin to form melanin in the center. And it will then, as the culture matures, the rest of the colony will turn dark. And here you see a colony that shows the melanin production in there. And this is common for this particular organism. The spores turn dark. Melanized fungus. This is a colony of a melanized fungus. You can see the dark melanin-like pigment inside this colony. And it's a yeast-like colony of Sporthrix schinkii. You can see someone wrote the name down on there when they identified it. First, they didn't know what it was. You can see the question mark. And once they looked at it, they knew exactly what it was. This is the example of a colony that is older, that has become much more mature, and it has melanin all throughout the whole colony. And it's turned kind of leather-like and dry. It's totally different from what it started out to be, which was yeast-like, and was just probably a month or so old. And if you were to try to make a mount from this colony, you would have to take a wire and cut a piece out, and it's like cutting a piece of leather out. This is really a highly melanized isolate of Sporothrix schinkii, totally dark black, not all that common. This is a primary isolate of Sporothrix schinkii, and you can see that it has a fluffy a central part of the colony, along with the perimeter being a little bit more kind of maybe feather-like. And this is the same isolate on different medium. And here it looks almost yeast-like on that medium. So we have two different media with the same culture growing differently on two different media. Here's another one. These are kind of star or stellate colonies on a medium. This is still the same isolate from the same patient on a third medium. So Sporthrix schinkii produces these small, delicate septate hyphae we've talked about with all the others. This one has probably even smaller septate hyphae that are produced. And if you look at the culture underneath the microscope, what you'll see are canidia fours that will be a long stalk. that are very delicate. They may be short, but they're very delicate. And at the tip, you find these spores connected to the tip of this long canidia four by a little thread-like attachment. And that's where it gets its name, Sporothrix schinkii. As the culture gets dark, it becomes pigmented, and the canidia begin to grow all the way around the hyphal strand, just like a sleeve on your shirt. And they call it the sleeve arrangement. And when it does this, then the canidia begin to turn dark because of the melanin. This is the beginning of the production of canidia with Sporothrix schinkii. If you notice that you'll see at the tip of some of those canidia fours, you'll see three or four spores beginning to be produced. Each one of those is connected by a thread-like attachment to that long canidia four. And in time, there will be a cluster of those up there that we call a floweret. And here's the floweret. And you can see the long stalk, that's a canidia four. And each of those spores is still connected to that canidia four, that long canidia four, by a thread-like attachment. And then notice along the sides of some of the high field spores coming off. That's the beginning of a sleeve arrangement. This is the floweret I was talking about. You can see them all over there. There's one almost in the, to the left and down a little bit to the bottom of center. That one shows you the floweret arrangement of canidia. This is kind of a good contrasting photomicrograph where you can see those canidia at the tip of a long canidia four. And there may be three or four of them there, and you don't see a total cluster, but that's how they're formed, just like that. This is the sleeve arrangement, showing these melanized, darkly pigmented spores that are produced. And they're produced after the flower red arrangement of spores is produced. And here you can see just how dark these are. This is all melanin in these things. This is melanized canidia. These are the spores or canidia of an older culture. And this just shows you a large view of how they're connected. But there is a thread-like attachment. And you can see one in the, to the left-hand side where it's connected to the, to the hyphal strand. Sporthrix schinkii is still a, a different in another way. And that is that we don't really have any probes or anything for this organism to identify. So we have to rely upon traditional methods to do that. And this organism actually is easily converted from the mold form to the yeast form. 
It's done by placing the mold form on a blood enriched medium incubated 35 to 37 degrees centigrade. And you might not believe this, but you can put it on there during the day and come in tomorrow and the next day, and it will be converted from the mold form to the yeast form that quickly. You just make a mount of it, and there are those yeast cells. The yeast cells are different from the other things that we've seen, and they're elongated. They look like cigars. They're called cigar bodies. And they're about the same size as histoplasma, between 2 to 6 microns. Some of them are round, some are oval. It might look a little bit like histoplasma, but you'll still see the elongated ones. And the yeast colonies that are grown up during the night are creamy, smooth, and bacterial-like. And this is the example. The top is the melanized mold form, and it converted to that creamy, yeast-like form after being incubated 35 to 37 degrees centigrade. And there are the cigar bodies. They're elongated cells. And that's about the only yeast that you see that is elongated is Sporthrix. And this is a better example here. You see the elongated cells here. And each one of those is capable of producing a bud and it just continues on.